broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, all. My name is Preston Bucati. I'm an attorney and consultant with IT Governance USA. Thank you for joining us on our webinar this morning titled Closing the Gap Between the CCPA and GDPR. We're going to be discussing the California Consumer Privacy Act and its requirements and where those requirements overlap with Europe's general data protection regulation to help give you some insight on how you can build a compliance program that simultaneously complies with both laws. I'm gonna say, let's give it a couple more minutes in case we've got folks joining late. I see a couple more people joining the webinar right now. So we'll just give it another minute or two in case folks are grabbing coffee or coming from a meeting. And we'll get started here just in a second talking more about the CCPA and GDPR. Okay, thank you. Again, my name is Preston Bucati. I'm a consultant and attorney with IT Governance USA. We're here today to talk about the CCPA, California's Consumer Privacy Act, and its overlap with Europe's general data protection regulation. So again, thank you for joining. Let's get started today discussing on how to close the gap between CCPA and GDPR compliance. First things first, who are we giving you this presentation? Well, like I said earlier, my name is Preston Bucati. I'm an attorney and consultant with IT Governance USA, and we're your one-stop GRC shop, right? Everything from governance, risk management, and compliance, we do it all. Increasingly engaged in data privacy and cybersecurity consulting as those laws roll out across Europe, California, New York, Nevada, Washington, Texas, and other states in the US. And then a variety of cyber resilience services on the back end as well to help make sure that your technical components of your compliance program are actually able to achieve minimum viable compliance under the law or perhaps some new standard you're trying to certify to like PCI DSS or ISO 27001, perhaps the new ISO privacy standard, ISO 27701. So we've got all sorts of products and services available to help guide you through this compliance journey. But let's talk a little bit about the compliance journey you're probably facing, right? A short overview and definitions from the CCPA and GDPR to understand what those laws are. And that'll dovetail nicely into the key differences and overlapping requirements of those various laws. From there, we can start to define practical steps for initiating a compliance program. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. I know for those of you that have joined some questions we received from the audience in advance. So if you've got others, please don't hesitate to enter them into the portal or email them along to our team. And we can address those questions at the end and try to get you all the help you need. So let's start with the CCPA. What is it exactly? Well, the California Consumer Privacy Act is a messy piece of legislation that arrived as a result of a ballot initiative. So for those of you that don't know the history of this law, it actually began as a ballot initiative sponsored by an individual in California by the name of Alastair McTaggart, real estate developer with some money to blow. And he, after discussing how Google and other tech companies in his home state were using personal data, took this on very much as a private matter and decided he was going to do something about it, started hiring consultants, legislative teams to draft a ballot initiative that was meant to go to California voters in the fall of 2018. 
Naturally, all of the businesses in California were antithetical to that idea. They were trying their best to ensure that any proposed piece of legislation that would impact their business model would have their spin on it. And so as a result, they engaged in intense lobbying efforts in conjunction with legislative redrafting that took place over the summer of last year. And as a result, they spit out this law after a relatively short period of time to try to dictate how companies in California are meant to process, store, collect, and retain personal information. And so you see there on the slide that law will take effect now January 1st of this year. Since last summer, there have been various amendments and legislative revisions to try to clean up that mess, although some of the dirt still remains, and California will likely engage more time and energy over the course of next year to continue drafting and revising this law at as other states increasingly release their own privacy laws, like I mentioned, Nevada, New York, and others. Now, on the whole, this law is not terribly complex. At its most basic, the CCPA requires that organizations, institutions in California that collect personal information actually explain what they're doing with that data, why they're collecting it, what they're using it for, and they need to start to give California consumers some rights in relation to their data, right? Perhaps a right to have that data deleted, a right to have that data not sold onward to other third parties, and at the very least getting access to that information so that people can start to understand what businesses are doing with their information, right? What they're collecting from them, what they're learning about them, and what they're using it all for. So here we've got a breakdown of the roles and relationships under the CCPA. And for those of you that are familiar with the framework under the GDPR, this should look familiar to you. To start, we've got the California Attorney General, right, akin to a European supervisory authority. That's the body that's in charge of assessment and enforcement. Now, on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got service providers, right? Typically, your, your back-end SaaS providers, a company like Salesforce or Oracle or Workday, Azure, AWS, those people that are processing a subset of data for some specific reason, but they're not actually the ones engaging with consumers to collect that data. They're not in charge of the purposes and means for why that personal information is being collected and used. So to that end, we've got your business here, this, the main hub in the spoke of the wheel. They are the organization that is primarily tasked with duties that flow outward to the consumer. And Going backwards then, we've got rights of the consumer that flow back to the business, right? And some of those relate to the concept of a verifiable consumer access request, or CAR. The idea that a consumer should be reaching out to the business for information and explanation of how the business is processing the consumer's personal information. Part of that will naturally involve an explanation of the data supply chain and how back-end service providers are either processing, storing, or deleting personal data as well. So to that end, a business needs to ensure that its relationship with its service providers is also clarified by contract, certain actions are prohibited, and perhaps that there's a certification element to ensure that service providers are able to meet their security obligations on behalf of the business that's ultimately at the center of all of this. So you see here some other rights and obligations, right? Contract flows and ability to create a do not sell options, security questions, et cetera. So then, who must comply? Presumably, if you guys have joined this webinar, you've no doubt seen this information, and hopefully you're already familiar with it. Your organization will be subject to the jurisdiction of this law based on the material threshold elements you see here over on the left-hand side of the screen, right? If you have at least $25 million in annual revenue, or if alone or in combination you buy receive for a business commercial purpose, sell or share the personal information of at least 50,000 consumers, households or devices, or more than half of your revenue comes from the sale of personal data, again, you'll be subject to the material jurisdiction of this state law. Now, the question always comes for those of us in the United States familiar with the Federal Republic model, what if I'm not in that state? Does the law still apply to me? Well, you can see some of that information on the right-hand side of the screen. This is called territorial jurisdiction. So every law that's passed by every state in our grand republic is dealing with territorial and material jurisdiction, right? 
are you subject to the laws of my state by virtue of you physically being here? And I always advise my clients, if you think the sheriff can drive to your door and kick it in, you probably need to comply. But what if I'm not physically in the state, right? What if I actually don't have a brick and mortar location within the physical confines of the state of California, but I do meet some of the material jurisdiction elements? Do I still have to comply? Well, the question, and I think there's increasing clarity on this, is how much business do you do in California, right? The fundamental issue is if you are availing yourself of that economic market by participating of your own volition, then in turn, you need to follow the laws of that economic market, right? When I travel to Italy for vacation, I have to follow the laws of Italy. In much the same way, if you are opting to participate in California's economy by selling products or services to Californians, then the California Attorney General is going to expect that you conduct that activity in accordance with local law. So I just said we are seeing increasing clarity on this topic, and what I'd like to remind you all of is a recent Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court ultimately decided that internet sales, sales of products conducted over the internet, can be charged local sales tax. I hope maybe if you're anything like me, you remember the good old days when you could buy stuff on Amazon and you didn't have to pay local sales tax. Well, that's no more because the US Supreme Court has decided that even if you're not physically in a state, you can participate in that economy to a sufficient degree that you need to follow that law. That rule has been applied to Amazon, presumably it may apply to you. So the question you need to ask yourself is, if you do not reside in California, if you don't have a brick and mortar location, but you do serve California residents, are you required to comply? Ultimately, that depends on the extent that you process the data of California residents. And so what I've been advising clients is if you reference other pieces of California legislation, you sort of see a bar, perhaps a threshold set at about 500 or more residents. And I'm leaning on that from the California Customer Records Act, which deals with breach notification requirements. And so my assumption, I think is fair, that if you're dealing with the data of perhaps more than 500 California residents, it may be presumed that you are now subject to this law and you need to comply even though, like I said, you may not be physically located there and the sheriff can't come kick in your door. What they'll do is they'll send you uh, an agent, you're, they'll, you're, they'll send you a registered agent, a service of process, and they'll expect you to fly into court to defend yourself. Otherwise, they'll issue summary judgment and you'll have to pay a fine. So again, who must comply? You see the material threshold elements on the left. If you're not physically in California, you need to start to figure out how much California data do I have, which can be increasingly difficult especially if you can't drill down into the data that you have. Now on the flip side, what is the GDPR? Well, hopefully, again, if you've joined the webinar today, you hopefully have at least a modicum of understanding of what the GDPR is, right? That's Europe's general data protection regulation, sort of the watershed moment in privacy and cybersecurity law that has brought us ultimately to where we are today. So that law, as you may remember, took effect back on May 25th of 2018. And that gives individuals control over the, how their information is collected and processed. And I want to hit on that again. The GDPR is very much putting power in the hands of data subjects. Whereas the CCPA is cognizant of the business value that data processing provides to ca the California economy. And so although there are some rights that are given to residents of California, it's not entirely as clear cut. You see here also at the bottom of the screen that the GDPR is fundamentally based on a risk-based approach to data protection. And that's something a lot of our clients sometimes struggle with. It's not a prescriptive law that outlines a set of requirements. It's requiring you fundamentally to change your methodology and your thinking as it involves personal data, collection, processing, storage, and deletion. It's making you as an organization consider the privacy risk of individuals when you use their data. By contrast, as you saw with the CCPA, really all that you have to do is explain what you're doing with the data. So for example, you don't have to collect consent. You don't need a valid legal basis for processing data under the CCPA. You just need to explain what's going on. So who must comply with the GDPR? Again, hopefully you're familiar with this concept. If you are processing the data of Europeans, if you're offering goods or services into that economic area, if you're monitoring their behavior, 
then you have to comply with the GDPR. Now, the GDPR is a little more liberal on the territorial jurisdiction issue. As you see, location is not a problem, right? Regardless of wherever you may be, whether you are a small mom and pop selling items over the internet in Iowa, or you're offering products and services from Italy, if you are touching the personal data of European residents, it will be expected that you comply with the GDPR as it relates to that data. Location is not an issue like it can sometimes be under the CCPA. It's a little bit more clear cut. So some key differences. Like I just hit on, the main difference here is the breadth of the jurisdiction. GDPR covers the entirety of the European Union, whereas in contrast, the CCPA only really applies to California. And in fact, if we drill deeper, we'll find that the CCPA is very specific in terms of definitions and jurisdiction. You saw in the last slide around who must comply with the CCPA, it's only certain people doing certain things with data, right? It's certain businesses over a certain monetary value or certain businesses that process a certain amount of personal information for a commercial purpose or a business purpose, whereas the GDPR applies to anybody who's processing the personal data of Europeans. And so to that end, right, the GDPR is covering a broad set of business practices, whereas the GDPR is, or excuse me, the CCPA is really more focused, if you read the legislation, is really more focused on the commercial use of information, the sale of information. There are obligations that apply to companies that merely collect data, but there's a greater set of obligations that apply to companies that are turning around and using that data for an economic advantage. So like you see on the slide here, the CCPA only covers certain types of organizations that collect certain information from certain people. It really only wants to regulate organizations that collect personal information, not necessarily all organizations out there, but just those ones that are primarily engaged in this activity. And again, it's only concerning the personal data of California residents. So not Americans as a whole, just those people that are truly California citizens. They live there, they reside there, they are there for other than a temporary purpose, right? They're not just going to Disney World on vacation, they actually live in California. So the question for you as an organization, can you drill down into that? Can you figure out how many of your customers are actual California residents? If you can't do that with any amount of clarity, I would assume that you should start getting ready to comply. So more key differences here, right? Who is protected? Under the GDPR, the goal is to protect data subjects in the EU. And you see that most clearly by the fact that these data subjects have a strong set of rights around their personal data processing. In contrast, the CCPA is protecting consumers living in California. And although there are some nuances into how those two words of art are defined, you'll see under the CCPA, there are really only about four rights. And in fact, I would argue there's even less than that. You see here the right to prevent a sale, that's only going to apply if a company's selling your data. So that's not a full right that happens all the time. The right to deletion actually has a number of iterated exceptions under which a business is not required to delete data. And so at the end of the day, at its most distilled version, the cynic in me says that CCPA isn't really giving consumers any rights at all. It's forcing companies to explain what they do with their personal data. It's giving consumers an option to have that delete it, deleted in certain circumstances. But as you'll see over the course of this webinar and presumably the more you dig into the regulation, you'll see that there are plenty of carve outs under which a business in California could eke out from under its responsibilities in one way or another. So it becomes incredibly important when you're dealing with CCPA compliance to understand the full body and scope of the regulation how it interacts with other existing California laws, like I mentioned the Customer Records Act, other laws that have been on the books in California for a decade or more that no doubt you're probably openly violating today. Whereas the GDPR by contrast, again, it's an all-inclusive risk-based methodological approach to risk management and privacy risk. So it almost applies to everyone, everywhere. It's more like a way of thinking Whereas in contrast, the CCPA is really some certain requirements in certain circumstances, depending on certain uses of data. So let's talk about some of these words of art in a little more detail, right? Under the CCPA, you saw on one of the earlier slides that we're dealing with the difference between a business and a service provider. 
And so typically the business, that's the organization that's determining the purposes and means of the data being collected, right? They're the company that you log on to on the internet. They've got the web form in your face that's asking for data, right? They're the company that you go to at the mall to buy a pair of shorts and they say, can we get your email? That's the business at issue. Those are the core companies responsible for CCPA compliance. Whereas again, in contrast, you've got your backend service providers. They play a part here. They form an integral part of your data supply chain, but primary onus of responsibility falls on the business. Now in the GDPR, we can liken this to the data controller versus data processor distinction. And in fact, the definition of a business under the CCPA is quite similar to the definition of a data controller under the GDPR. Both are essentially the organization that determines the means and purposes of processing, whereas the data processor, AKA the service provider, is really only processing the data based on specific instructions coming from the business, coming from the data controller, right? So for example, if you hire ADP to process your payroll, presumably you'll have a service contract with ADP that clearly outlines what data is being sent to them and what it's being used for, right? ADP is not going to start collecting your employee badges because they have access to it. They're only going to process the information you give them. That's the service provider, the data processor, right? So they're more of a back-end function. And to that end, like I said, although they play an integral part in your data supply chain, and as such, they need to be able to demonstrate compliance independently and on your behalf, for example, responding to consumer access requests. Again, the primary onus of responsibility falls on the business or the data controller. They're that central hub in the spoke of the wheels. So then what type of information should we worry about? This is always the next question. And what I'll tell you at a high level, I'll let you read the slides at your leisure. You need to be worried about personal data. Now I know that may not be helpful, but the analogy I tell people is think of this like pieces of a puzzle, right? When you go to the store and you buy a puzzle, you see a pretty picture on the outside of the box, but you take that box and you lift the lid and there's a jumble of puzzle pieces. Those puzzle pieces are like data elements, right? My IP address, cookies, internet browsing history, search terms, biometric identifiers, name, email address, phone number, et cetera. They're all data elements. The question you need to decide is, can an individual person, a data subject in Europe, a consumer under the CCPA, can that person actually be identified by virtue of that data element, right? And so think about that again, like pieces of a puzzle. If you have my driver's license, if you have my name, my address, a photo of me, that's a pretty big puzzle piece. You can likely figure out the picture on the front of the box with just that one data element. Whereas in contrast, if you have my IP address, you probably can't figure out too much, right? At least on its own. The issue you'll face though, what if you start collecting more and more IP addresses, right? You've got more and more pieces of the puzzle to start to identify that picture. And now that human, that individual person whose privacy we're ultimately concerned with, you can start to identify them, right? A little bit more and more. And so you see how the CCPA has picked up on a definition of personal data that's quite similar to the GDPR. There are some nuances, for example, there needs to be some sort of reasonable capability to associate that individual with the data. Whereas in contrast under the GDPR, it's more of a theoretical, if it could be possible, than it is personal data. Again though, the important thing to contrast and the main takeaway from this slide, look at the difference in the definition of personal information as compared to other state laws. Typically other existing state laws, which mostly at this time regulate data breach notification, they define personal information as a very specific set of data elements. And typically it will be some combination of access or verification information, right? So a name in combination with something else, a username in combination with a password, an email in combination with security questions, a first and last name in combination with a social security number or driver's license, right? A financial account details. So typically, Personal information as defined under existing state law is very specific, whereas increasingly under these privacy laws, the trend is to explode that definition, make it much more broad, and try to figure out, hey, can any data elements actually be linked back to this person? Is this person identifiable, either directly or indirectly, 
from the data that we have? If so, now you're creeping into personal information, and as such, that's going to be data that falls under the subject of the statute. So then, breach notification. This is a big difference between the two laws, and I hit on this not so much to emphasize the difference, but to try to point out the varying approaches. Under the CCPA, there actually is no breach notification requirement. Again, I talked about it at the start of the webinar. The CCPA is a confusing, bundled mess of laws that are not clearly iterated. So there is no requirement for breach notification in the California Consumer Privacy Act. To understand your breach notification requirements in California, you'd actually have to turn to a separate statute. And you see that on the screen there, California Customer Records Act, which actually has its own definition of personal information, you see at the bottom of the slide, and, and that definition is more aligned to traditional state breach notification laws. So breach notification then, not only do you have a different subset of information, you've got one subset of data that's subject to the CCPA, another overlapping subset of data that's subject to breach notification requirements. As a business, you'll have to figure out when and where your, uh, the, your obligations apply under those various sets of data. And you can see here some of the other things, timing of the notification, in contrast to the GDPR, in the CCPA, or at least in California, I should say, you have to notify individuals without unreasonable delay. There's no strict time requirement like in the CCPR. Again, it's a little bit more vague, a little bit more business friendly perhaps. You also see the format of the notification. There's actually some details on exactly what needs to be included in that breach notification. As a matter of fact, they give you a format template in the body of the law itself. Now, we see here under the GDPR, again, hopefully you're familiar with this concept. In contrast, the GDPR has some very onerous breach notification requirements, right? Not only does it require you to consider the privacy risk to individuals at issue, right? So it's not a, did it happen and tell them? It requires that risk-based sort of thinking. But to that end, you only have 72 hours to actually get your notification out, a much shorter amount of time, right? You see at the bottom of the slide, though, data processors are supposed to notify data controllers as soon as possible. But again, it's a little bit more onerous, a little bit more clear cut and understandable, whereas the CCPA is a little bit more messy and you've got to dig in various places to figure out exactly what's required here. Again, in contrast, GDPR, Article 33, Article 34, Boom, lays it out, here are your requirements for breach notification. So I want to hit on that, and this dovetails nicely into these slides because the fundamental issue is this. In the GDPR in Europe, we kind of have this sort of opt-in model, right? A business can only use a consumer's data if that data is being lawfully collected. And so to that end, consumers data subjects in the EU, they have a set of privacy rights that always apply to their data, right? So they sort of have the choice to opt in to data practices, to data sharing. And in that way, it's almost like a two-way street. The business needs to ensure it's meeting its obligations. And if so, only then will the data subject opt in to the processing of that data. So you can see some of the other requirements on the bottom. There's notice, perhaps some consent requirements under Article 6. But on the whole, you've got to really explain what you're doing with information, right? In contrast, the GDPR is more of an opt-out approach. The fundamental principle is that businesses can continue processing personal information as long as they explain that to consumers. You don't need a valid legal reason for processing the data. You can collect as much data as you want, and you can do whatever you want with it as long as you explain that to consumers they then have the option to opt out of that activity, right? Perhaps by virtue of deleting their information, perhaps by virtue of opting out of a sale. Again, though, you don't sort of have to bring them into the fold. You just very much have to explain what you're doing, and if they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. So I want you to think about the overlap between these opt-in and opt-out models. You will saw on the last slide, and you see it to this one, a lot of this ultimately comes down to notice, explaining to people what you are doing with their data, regardless of whether they choose to participate in that processing or not, 
both laws are going to require you to transparently explain how your company collects, processes, and stores personal information. So some other key differences here. Under the GDPR, again, presumably you're, you are familiar with the penalties under the GDPR, we've got this revenue threshold issue where ultimately if you are found to be in violation, you can receive a fine up to 4% of global annual turnover. Now, in the CCPA, the fines are much smaller, at least on paper. You can see on the slide, the attorney general, AKA the supervisory authority, can fine as much as up to $7,500 per violation, a paltry sum to almost any business. And should an individual consumer bring a private right of action, they are limited to $100 to $750 for statutory damages or actual damages, whichever is higher. Again, not terribly much. Here's the issue though. You see that last bullet on the slide, the CCPA places more emphasis on individuals as opposed to the nature of the breach. You saw in the previous slide under GDPR, a lot of breach notification and the issue there is ultimately related to the privacy risk of individuals, right? Where under the CCPA, this issue, this private action comes up under section 150, the security requirement under the CCPA, and it allows for a consumer to sue a company directly and individually if their data is breached as a result of unreasonable security. Now again, part of that is reference to the California Customer Records Act, so that's a certain definition when I use the word personal information in that context. But that's ultimately the issue here. Imagine what would happen if you had a data breach of 100 million customers and each one of those customers sued you for $100. You are now looking at potentially a $1 billion lawsuit, certainly much more than the 22 million euros that the GDPR would attempt to fine, and I'd argue they're having a tough time doing it because they haven't issued many fines since May of 2018, whereas those Americans on the call today can no doubt agree with me that the United States is a particularly litigious society and so undoubtedly, we will start to see lawsuits of all types and sizes under the CCPA beginning on January 1st to see how much money plaintiff's attorneys can squeeze out of these companies. So again, that's the real kicker under the CCPA. Although it doesn't seem like you have to do that much, there is a heavy, heavy penalty for screwing it up because now you're on the hook individually to private action. So at a high level then, what are we left with? Well, we've got the California Consumer Privacy Act, right? It's one law for one state, and the issue is the amount of overlap. There's overlap with existing California laws, there's overlap with existing state laws, there's overlap with existing federal laws. And so the question then becomes, who has to comply with this law, right? Well, we saw the definition from an earlier slide, and at the end of the day, it's Organizations that are for profit, and in fact, that definition says organized for the financial benefit. So it's not necessarily for profit. You could be, for example, a credit union, technically a nonprofit, but still organized for financial benefit. You may still need to comply, right? So then threshold requirements, we saw those size revenue based on the types of activity at issue. And again, you see overlap with other laws. So the CCPA was written in consideration of some of this overlap. If you are following compliance requirements under other privacy laws like HIPAA or GLBA, you may be absolved of some of your obligations. Now, the important thing to consider is this, and I'll use HIPAA as an example, right? If you are following HIPAA with regard to your patient health information, okay, fine, you are presumably protecting the privacy of those consumers, no issue. What about your employees? What about your business contacts? Is that personal data folded into your HIPAA compliance program? Presumably not, and so you'll need to build CCPA compliance for those data elements. Same goes with GLBA, right? If you're dealing with financial data and it's compliant under that law, that's great. You've still got to deal with compliance issues on all the business emails you collect when talking to suppliers and partners. And you've also got to start to build privacy compliance programming for your internal employees, right? If you've got California employees, they are consumers as well, and they have the same rights with regard to their data.
So then jurisdiction, we saw, again, this is primarily limited to the state of California, but if you are not physically located in the state but still engage with California residents, you will be expected to comply, at least as it applies to that subset of information. Again, if you're not able to drill into your data stores, your data lakes, with that level of granular detail, and if you don't feel comfortable arguing that in front of the California Attorney General in the courtroom, then I would argue you should start to comply as a whole, because if you can't tell me that you have less than 500 California residents data in your database, I'm going to assume you have more, and I would assume you need to comply. If you disagree with me, I'm happy to take you to court, right? Because I'm looking at potentially a billion dollars in winnings on my side, so I've got nothing to lose if I try to bleed you dry in the process. Finally, and we saw the definitions, right? Personal information, that's the watershed thing with CCPA in the United States. It's blowing up that definition of personal information to include things like cookies, browsing history, geolocations, olfactory, visual, thermal information, all sorts of data elements outside the traditional definition of that term. And we can also see, like the GDPR, it's picking up on this sort of understanding of, hey, one company is actually collecting and using the data, and other people are maybe just processing it on their behalf. How do rights and obligations apply to those different parties, right? Our businesses, our service providers, akin to a data controller versus a data processor under the GDPR. So again, contrast that with the GDPR. Under the GDPR, we've got one law for all of the European Union, a standard across the continent. It applies to all organizations, regardless of size requirements. And what's more interesting is that the GDPR actually also applies to government agencies in some contexts. So again, it's very much focused on privacy of individuals. It's not trying to regulate the use of data. It's trying to protect the privacy of European residents. And so to that end, the law's jurisdiction applies to firms operating in the EU or firms that market to EU residents regardless of whether uh, of where they may be located. And then of course, again, you're hopefully familiar with the definition of personal data, data subjects, controllers, and processors from the GDPR. That same model has started to bleed over into the United States and invariably that will be picked up by other states as well, right? If we're seeing it in California, it's only a matter of time before other states start to copy a bit. So GDPR versus CCPA. The GDPR requires businesses to process data in accordance with some core principles. In contrast, the CCPA only requires businesses to process data in a manner that's consistent with their notice and in a secure manner, right? You basically have to explain what you're doing and secure data in the process Whereas under the GDPR, you have to give data subjects these rights, right? Access, notice, rectification, erasure, portability, and objection. Whereas under the CCPA, you really only need to give people notice and access, right? Explain what you're doing with your data. And then give them a chance to reach out to either delete that data or prevent the onward sale of that data if that's an activity you are engaged in. So... Finally, the crux of the issue then, hopefully you can sense by virtue of my conversation thus far that there are clear similarities between the two laws, right? Both laws share two basic requirements. You need to create a privacy notice that explains what the heck you're doing with personal data. And I would argue that even if you are not legally obligated to do that yet in your jurisdiction, that is increasingly a good idea. That's where the trend is going on the consumer side of this issue. And your customers, even if they're not European, even if they're not Californian, they're going to start to expect this from you. Human beings in 2019 and beyond are going to demand an understanding of how their personal information is used. And so we are fundamentally moving away from this data is oil concept that's pervaded the tech economy over the past 20 or 15 years. It's not free for your use. You need to stop abusing it and misusing it. And I'm looking at you, Facebook. And you need to actually protect our information. It's our property and you need to fairly explain what you're going to do with it before you borrow it. You need to secure it while it's in your custody and you need to give it back to me when you're done, right? So again, GDPR, CCPA, or whatever other privacy acronym you want to dream up next year, you need to create a privacy notice that explains what's going on. Number two, you need to create a method 
by which your customers, aka consumers, aka data subjects, can actually reach out to you for more information, right? So that they can get a more in-depth understanding of the actual processing at issue, right? So you probably have a high-level privacy policy that generally explains practices across your corporate entity. You'll need to create a communication method by which people can individually reach out to you for more information about how their personal data specifically may be processed. So again, high level, you need to be more transparent with how you process personal information. And increasingly, you will be expected to not just be transparent, but give your users, your consumers, your data subjects, a role in that process, right? Giving them level of direct access to what information of theirs is being collected, what's being shared or sold, and who exactly that information is being shared or sold to. So then as you can see, these laws at a high level certainly have similar requirements for compliance and organizations can comply with both as long as they implement a sensible programmatic approach to privacy issues as a whole. Stop focusing on the issue of the day, stop focusing on the new acronym and start to think about this as an issue. I don't care if it's GDPR, CCPA, ABCD or 1234, Privacy is an issue and your organization needs to address that. So to that end, you need to start mapping your data so you understand what you're doing with it and you need to start telling other people as well. This is a nice slide that tries to give a Venn diagram model of exactly what I've been talking about here, right? The GDPR you can see on the left has a lot more requirements that are very much more specific to the GDPR really, right? DPO as an example, data privacy officer, that's very much a GDPR issue. Same with the issue around international data transfers and privacy shield. In contrast, the CCPA is really about the processing of personal data of Californians under certain circumstances for businesses of a certain size. And so as a result, the obligations are a little bit less onerous but there are certainly elements of overlap, right? And you see those in the middle. Enforcement rights for sure, although tends to lean a bit more on the GDPR side, whereas breach notification and security requirements are going to be applicable to both. Whether it's Article 32 under the GDPR or Section 150 under the CCPA, as a company, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have appropriate and reasonable technical and organizational approaches to cybersecurity, right? A risk-based approach. You also need to prepare methods for third-party disclosure, right? Your interaction with service providers, AKA service providers or data processors, right? So how exactly are other people in your supply chain fulfilling your obligations, right? Around security as an example, or perhaps consumer access requests. And so to that end, you need to understand the scope of your data processing. You need to create a privacy policy that explains that activity. And at the very least, you need to start to prepare ways to delete personal data. Whether you are asked by a consumer directly or whether you are implementing a data retention policy as a matter of corporate best practice, you need to start to consider the full life cycle of the data you have, the personal data. From collection to storage to transfer to deletion, what are you collecting? What are you doing with it? Who are you giving it to and why? What are they doing with it? And how can a consumer get access to that at any point in the process? So some steps to CCPA compliance then. Hopefully this is important for some of you that are trying to figure out just what do I need to be doing before January, 20, January 1st, 2020. Well, here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to get board level support because nothing is going to get done without senior management's commitment. And as I always tell my clients, you can't get anything done with a human being unless you have a carrot or a stick, right? You're either incentivizing them to do good or you are disincentivizing them to do bad. You're not going to get that carrot or stick, though, without senior management support, right? So you need them to be bought in. Tone at the top across the organization needs to be hitting on the importance of personal data and privacy. From there, conduct a gap analysis. See what you're already doing well. Where are you literally already meeting your compliance obligations? You may find that there's not that much more you need to do, right? So examine your existing privacy policy. If you don't have one, hang up the phone now and go do it. You should have done it years ago, 
or contact me and I'll sue you later and try to make money off of it. No, I kid, but seriously, conduct a gap analysis, right? Don't start running around as if this is a fire, an emergency. Figure out what you need to do holistically and build that programmatic approach, right? Try to align your compliance requirements across various jurisdictions in a sensible way so that you're not repeating this activity time and time again, right? You wanna build a compliance model that can account for the requirements of GDPR, CCPA, the New York Shield Act, or others. From there, obviously data mapping is of critical importance. You can't explain what you are doing with personal data if you don't know what you're doing with it. And I would argue that almost everybody on this call has no idea how their company processes personal data. That's been my experience now for a number of years. I can almost guarantee that someone in your IT function is using a tool or service that you don't know about or someone in your sales or marketing function is collecting data you don't know about. It's natural, it happens. Corporate spread, people are encouraged to approach their job in a way that suits them. There's an increasing prevalence of teleworking, working from home, bring your own device. People sign up for freemium services like Asana, Trello, and Slack, and others. So invariably, you're gonna have data scattered all over the place. You need to figure out where that is. And as a lawyer, I want you to think about this before I move on to the next topic. Consider the concept of a consumer access request, right? I'm a consumer. I'd like to know what personal data you're processing about me, right? A consumer access request. Sounds simple enough. Well, let's think about this. I'm an employee. I've been working at your company for a number of years, and I feel that I've been discriminated against. So I finally get fired, and I hit you with a consumer access request. Please give me all of the information and personal data you've been processing on me. As a company, you may be obligated to turn over the thousands of emails that have my name on them, the potentially hundreds of thousands of instant messages that have my name on them. That can put you in a terribly tricky legal situation outside of privacy issues, right? And I've seen that happen with several companies. Again, increasingly, plaintiff's attorneys are using privacy laws, not just to enforce privacy rights as a whole, which is a topic near and dear to my heart, but as another avenue to get at other pieces of litigation, right? So wrongful termination, data discovery requests can now be categorized as a consumer access request. As an organization, you need to be clear on those implications, right? So to that end, you need to develop operational policies and procedures, not only to understand how you should be collecting and processing the personal data of business partners and customers, but also on the appropriate internal uses of personal information so that you don't create more legal headache down the road. From there, you'd be working closely with your information security team to remediate system vulnerabilities and build that programmatic, that risk-based approach to cybersecurity so that you can demonstrate you are taking appropriate steps to protect the privacy of individual data regardless of where that is. And that's tricky, that's something that the IT folks may struggle with because the issue is that cybersecurity is somewhat black and white, right? We can all understand some basic concept of cybersecurity, whereas privacy is more contextual, right? And I'll use an analogy to make this point clear. Think about your own home. You would certainly consider some elements of good security at your home, locking the doors, closing the blinds, closing the garage door before you leave, et cetera, right? Privacy, though, is much more context dependent. I care about who enters my home depending on who that is and what they're there for. I'm happy to allow my neighbor, who also acts as a police officer, to come into my home off duty outside of working hours when he doesn't have the gun and the badge. You're more than welcome to come hang out. If he's knocking on my door in the gun and the badge with that uniform on, the context is different, right? And now my privacy rights are changing. So trying to figure out cybersecurity in, in conjunction with privacy can be difficult because privacy is context dependent. Who has access to certain information will depend on what that information is and who they what they need it for. So you need to start training your staff, right? Not just on your operational policies and procedures and best practices, but you're wanting to build that resiliency and competency internally so that staff are aware of this issue and they're constantly being encouraged along the lines of data minimization. And I say that because, think about it, the less personal data you have, the less you have to deal with. So as a company, your compliance obligations can be greatly reduced if you can rely on less personal information.
and I, you're welcome to record my voice and take that back to your marketing team after you're done here. Try to get by with less. It will make your life easier. So at the end of the day, once you've done all that, you need to turn around and monitor those activities, perhaps conduct some audit. You want to make sure people are actually doing this stuff. They are walking the walk. It's one thing to outline a set of rules and responsibilities, but if nobody's actually doing it, there's no benefit at all. And you can ask Equifax about their patch process if you don't believe me there. So naturally, IT governance has some next steps that we would suggest for you to help you along your compliance journey. And these are particularly near and dear to my heart, right? Because for me, in part, I was involved in some of them, and I'm also a privacy guy. I like to help businesses figure out how they can achieve their objectives, ultimately to keep making money and make a lot more of it, without ruining the fundamental construct of our society by over leveraging personal data. We've already felt some implications courtesy of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. So I think as a whole, the global world is trying to understand how do we manage personal information? Well, let us help you with that. We've got books and toolkits to guide you. We've also got a CCPA gap analysis tool to try to give you that understanding of where you may already comply and also on top of that, what best practices you may want to pick up, right? So that tries to break down both legal compliance and industry best practice. We've also got a variety of training courses that go into this topic in a lot more detail. And each one of our training courses is delivered by a practicing consultant in this area. So they have a lot of practical advice, not just on the theoretical constructs of these laws, but actually how to start doing stuff at your company. And I deliver plenty of those courses. I always find them fun and interactive because really that's what it comes down to. It's less of a formal teaching moment and more of a group discussion on how we can all understand these laws and begin to comply with them sensibly. Because at the end of the day, while my job is to help you understand laws and comply with them, I don't wanna make that a rinse and repeat process. I want to give you the tools and technology you have to understand your obligations, to build a better mousetrap so that you can solve this problem once and for all and get back to your core business model. Now, some other useful tools for compliance. We've got our GDPR toolkits as well. Again, you saw there's a heavy amount of overlap between these two laws, and I would argue that if you are subject to the GDPR, that toolkit is gonna help you a lot with CCPA compliance, right? Building some of those privacy policies and procedures. We've also got a data flow mapping tool to help give you full visibility over the personal data your organization is processing. Now, the last topic I'll hit on before we open it up for questions is the ISO 27001 implementation bundles. Again, think back to this issue under the CCPA, security, section 150, private right of action, reasonable security. How, are, as a company, are you going to demonstrate you have good security in the face of a data breach, right? Fundamentally, you have to have bad security, right? Otherwise, a breach wouldn't have happened. So if you're finding yourself dragged into litigation over a data breach, how are you going to demonstrate and prove that you had good security? Well, you could argue over it at deposition and in courts at $500 an hour. I'm happy to take that money. I would love to buy a Learjet. But I think what's more sensible is to perhaps think proactively and try to build a risk-based approach. Like I was saying, the benefit of going after ISO is it gives you that certification. So if you do find yourself dragged into litigation over data security, you can now affirmatively demonstrate that you've got the world's class industry recognized implementation of cybersecurity. You've got a certificate that was issued by a third party auditor. What more could you possibly do, right? And increasingly some states in the United States, California potentially, but Ohio certainly, have recognized ISO 27001 as an affirmative defense to data breach litigation. It's essentially a way of saying we had good security and so there's nothing more we could have done. Of course, here's our contact information to get in touch with us for more detail. You can follow us on all the social media channels. I promise we don't collect and process your data for anything too nefarious. 
but we also are available by email, phone. You are welcome to reach out to me directly as well. I am happy to answer questions and talk you to death about privacy issues. If you ever find you need someone to put you to sleep, I'm happy to go through regulations to no end. But again, my goal here is to hopefully get you the information you need so you can get off and running with your core business model. So give us a shout if you need help with something. We're more than happy to assist you and guide you and point you in the right direction. To that end, I'm gonna open it up with questions. And I'm gonna start with one that I've received over the course of the day. If you've got more, feel free to populate them into the tool or email them to us. So the question here, are financial institutions who are not-for-profit institutions, AKA credit unions, that do not reside in California but serve California residents, are they required to comply? I would argue yes. I think ultimately this is a matter that will come down to litigation, but as you saw in the definition of the word business, it's an organization that is for profit or organized for financial benefit. And so while a credit union is technically a nonprofit, it's my understanding that they are organized for financial benefit. And so I could see a crafty plaintiff's attorney arguing that yes, a credit union would be subject to the CCPA. Now, hopefully that second half of the question we've already sort of hit on, right? Even though you don't reside in California, but you serve California residents, does that mean I need to comply? Ultimately, I think that will depend on how many California residents you serve. If it's one or two, probably not. If it's one or 200, maybe. If it's one or 2,000, probably so. So the more California residents you deal with, the more likely it is you need to comply with the CCPA on that subset of data, right? On those California residences data. Now I've got some follow-up questions here. Uh, we do have revenues in excess of 25 million. Okay, so you'd meet that requirement. We follow GLBA. Again, my, my point to hit on there would be, think about where the GLBA applies. Are you following GLBA as it applies to your own employees' data? What about customers from California that don't give you financial information, but perhaps just email something to customer service, right? What's happening with that name and email, that personal information? Now it says here, we do not sell data. Okay, great. You still have to explain what you're doing. However, we collect some data from visitors to our website, cookies, right? So if a consumer visits our site and then say goes to Facebook, it may pop up an ad from our credit union. So if a consumer wanted us to delete that information, there would be no way to tie that person to specific cookies we collected. I would argue you need to go back and talk to Google and Facebook and have them re-explain how their ad tech works. Because if I can go to your website and then I go to my Facebook account and I see your ads, presumably I'm being identified in some way, right? And at the very least, if you saw under the definition, cookies are considered personal information. So you need to explain how you are populating cookies on your website, how third parties may populate cookies on your website. Again, the weird nuance with cookies in California, there's existing obligations under California law. And so based on the wording of this question, I suspect there may be an open violation here. So I would advise you to contact your legal team, go back and look at the California regs and see what's required as it comes to cookie compliance in California specifically, perhaps in the EU if that is an issue, and then start to build a privacy notice that explains to people how those cookies function on your website. And you need to consider a way for you to delete them. Again, the ultimate issue may come down to who is the business versus the service provider there, right? Is the credit union the one that's collecting the cookies for their ad use or is Facebook the one collecting the cookies? If it's Facebook, then you have less obligations but you need to still explain to consumers what's going on and how they can affect their rights, right? So, hey, explaining to them that Facebook is dropping a cookie on your browser by virtue of visiting our site. For more information, go look at Facebook's privacy policy. And good luck there, right? Last time I checked, that was about over 9,000 words. I think I've read PhD thesis papers that are shorter and more clear cut. Uh, and the final part of this question I've received, uh, you know, I'm not clear on how all of this works. I'll fully admit I don't either, and I would bet you dollars to donuts your marketing team doesn't. The ad tech sector is incredibly complex, and I think if you are engaged in that practice, uh, 
cookie collection, third-party data ads that are being dropped and followed along as people browse. You want to be extremely clear with those companies you're engaged with on that topic to understand who is collecting what data for what purpose. Try to condition yourself as a service provider. Remove your obligations, right? Don't be the business at issue. Put that on the Facebooks and Googles of the world. They have multi-million dollar legal teams that can handle it, whereas if you're a small business, you should try to get out from under that obligation, right? So understand who's collecting what data for what purpose. That will help clarify who needs to do what, and hopefully you can push some of those obligations onto the big players, the Amazons and Microsofts and Googles of the world. So hopefully I addressed that question in full. If there are more questions though, I'm happy to get to them. I don't seem to see any in my chat feature, and so, if you guys are waiting for questions, again, feel free to populate them in. I'm happy to hang around. You're also welcome to email us after the webinar ends, directly or indirectly. It looks like I've got one more question here. Oh, several, in fact, so apologies. Let me, how do I obtain a copy of this webinar? Great question. We'll be sending that outwards to the people who have registered over the course of the day, so no worries there. What are the means provided to a business or consumer to confirm that their deletion request has been complied with? Well, that's a great question. So under the consumer access request pieces of the legislation, you are actually under an obligation to reply to a consumer within 45 days. So you've got to get back to them and sort of be like, hey, yes, we did actually delete your data. Now, on in terms of what level of verification is required, there's no statutory requirement. I would tell you as a business, you would want to be in a position to argue, right? So don't just say you have deleted data if you didn't actually do it. That's called lying. And in legal terms, that's called an unfair and deceptive trade practice. So if someone says, did you delete my data, you better be dang sure that you did do it. And as long as you can internally prove that, if you were ever called to the carpet, you should be fine. Now, what obligations are businesses under when a consumer calls in asking whether their data has been deleted from all of their third-party vendors? Well, you as the business at issue need to make sure that data is deleted from those third-party vendors. So your obligation is to make sure your contracts with service providers allow you to delete data. They support a consumer access request communication channel where those requests can be passed backwards. So for example, if you've got sales data on Salesforce, you need to make sure you can go in and delete that stuff. To that end, if you're a service provider, you don't need to be responsible to reply to consumer access requests, right? That's the obligation of the business. So you would wanna write your contract in such a way that customers or consumers are encouraged, perhaps forced, to contact the business at issue first. What are the key exceptions to deletion requests? Apologies that I didn't hit on those. Those are outlined fairly clearly in the regulations, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. That is a conversation for another time. Now, one of the slides uses the term EU residents and EU citizens. Can you please clarify if the GDPR covers EU residents or EU citizens? They are very different categories. I would ask whoever asked this question, why do you care? Are you collecting passports from your customers to verify whether they are actually legal citizens? If you're not doing that, you're not gonna know the difference, so why does it matter? I would argue if you are subject to the GDPR, if you're participating in the European market, Comply with the GDPR. The more you try to spear it away and put everything in a little pigeonhole, the more complicated your compliance life is going to be, right? Because again, let's say you're a global business and you've got millions of customers all over the globe. How much time and energy do you wanna invest in trying to figure out where these IP addresses are coming from and whether the user of that IP address is technically legally a citizen of that place or maybe they're just visiting there on vacation. You're gonna kill yourself in that activity. So I understand where the question is coming from, but I would argue ultimately it's a non-issue. If it's coming from the EU, I would assume that GDPR is an issue and you need to deal with it. If you are trying to carve out your compliance obligations based on a legal distinction between citizens and residents, you're going to create an entirely too complicated compliance process that invariably is gonna even collect more personal information that you've gotta comply with, right? Because again, what are you gonna collect? Social security numbers, driver's licenses, how are you going to prove citizens versus residents? Now, that could just be my opinion, but again, I, I would try to look at this holistically. Don't focus on citizens versus residents, focus on people. <clears throat> 
Next question here, is there a different set of values behind the CCPA as opposed to the values behind the GDPR? Yes, that's a great question, great question. So think about this, right? I don't know if you guys know this, but from about 1933 to 1945, things were pretty messy in Europe. And there was a certain country that collected a lot of personal data on its citizens using an American company by the name of IBM. And then they turned around and abused that information and started executing those people in mass. That is fundamentally Europe's experience with data privacy. In contrast, in the United States, we have a little something called the First Amendment, right? The concept of free speech. And so I would say, philosophically, the two countries, the two regions are approaching this issue from a totally different perspective. In Europe, there is much more of an understanding that we need to protect and preserve private information of individuals because we've seen how bad this can go. In contrast, in the United States, there's a little bit more of an onus on the individual, right? Individual responsibility is one of those key American apple pie sort of things. And so there's a lot more onus on individual participation, right? And we see that in the CCPA. G businesses are not going to reach out to you to ask for your permission to use data. You need to stand up and say something if you don't like it, right? You need to take some personal responsibility here. So I would argue that's the main difference in values between the CCPA and GDPR. Again, GDPR is coming from a historical experience where privacy has been abused. And so as a result, the onus is on organizations to affirmatively demonstrate they have a valid legal reason for collecting data. Otherwise, we're gonna assume you're doing something wrong with it. In contrast, in the United States, right, we'll let the free hand of the market decide who is protecting data the best. And so as long as companies simply give notice to individuals, then those individuals are free to choose whatever service they like, right? So if you read Facebook's privacy policy and you don't like it, you're welcome to go to MySpace. There's no onus on Facebook to affirmatively protect your privacy. They've just got to explain what you're doing. And if you don't like it, you could take your business elsewhere. Next question here, is my understanding correct that CCPA requires organizations to provide consumers a means to opt out of data collection? No, that is not correct. So what you need to do is give them an, a way to opt out of data sales. So if you are selling your data onwards, and presumably think about it, right? You're making money, the US government, Uncle Sam wants his cut. So if you're selling your data, you need to give consumers a way to opt out of that sale of data but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to stop collecting the data. Now, the one nuance I will bring up here is that think about the right to deletion. If someone emails you and says, please delete my data, okay, so you've got to delete the data you have on hand. Does that mean you have to stop collecting data? Not necessarily, but are you gonna still keep collecting data from someone who's affirmatively indicated they want nothing to do with you, right? They stood up, raised their hand, and contacted you and said, hey, please delete my information. I'd argue, how much more value are you gonna get out of that customer, right? You're, you're gonna be collecting marketing information or metrics and analytics from somebody who's fundamentally not participating with you as a customer anymore. So, no, I don't think the CCPA requires consumers a way to opt out of data collection, but if they opt, Op, or if they request their data to be deleted, I would argue there's no point in collecting data from that person anymore until they sort of opt in. How do I attain a copy of this webinar? Again, hopefully I answered that. Uh, a question here for IT governance, do we provide outside counsel services? Yes, we do. So we actually have a legal arm of our company with uh, fully registered and insured lawyers that can provide you legal advice on this and other issues. Again, like I said earlier, all of our consultants are practicing, uh, you know, practitioners. Uh, I myself am, am a lawyer certified here in Co Colorado. We've got other attorney consultants around the country. So we do our best to provide a mix of consultancy and legal services. I would just caution you to remember just because I am a lawyer does not mean I am your lawyer, right? That involves a certain level of formality so that you can get the benefits of that relationship, an attorney-client privilege, what have you. So if you are looking for actual lawyers, legal representation, feel free to contact us, we can help you. Just understand that that's fundamentally different from having a consultant help you with CCPA compliance, right? Because a consultant doesn't get that attorney-client privilege. That only applies to legal services. Now, CCPA has also opt, introduced opt-in 
as per today's news. I'm curious to know more about that. I saw nothing in the New York Times this morning. And based on my understanding, the CCPA is somewhat set in stone, at least until January, but apologies all. I don't know much more about that, so I'll have to do some research and find out more on what exactly is being mentioned there as it regards to today's news. That, though, is the end of our questions. And so unless there are others, I appreciate you all joining. I hope I answered your questions sufficiently enough or at least gave you enough of a sense to sort of maybe lead you down your own path. Don't hesitate to reach out. You can find me easily enough on LinkedIn if you want to continue the conversation. I'm more than happy. Again, this is my bread and butter. I'm a nerd on this topic. And so I'm more than happy to discuss privacy laws, compliance issues, regulatory and legislative issues around the country. I hope to see you again on another ITG webinar. And I hope that we've helped you in some way. If not, please give us feedback. We're always constantly looking to improve and grow. So with that, I'll say thank you. Again, this was an overview of the CCPA and GDPR, but the CCPA, as you've seen, is a complex piece of legislation. If you look at it on the internet, it's confusing, it's long, it's complex, it's chaotic. It takes a lot of time and energy to distill and sort through. So I've tried my best to give you a high level understanding, but this is not everything. There's a lot more involved, like those exceptions to the right to deletion, right? So reach out for more information, contact us. We're happy to help. With that, again, my name is Preston Bucati. I'll be signing off. Thanks for joining, and I hope to see you again.